G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Mark Ritson from Mini MBA in Marketing. He's based in Signet, which is near Hobart here in Tasmania. Thanks for your time today, Mark. Good day, Troy. Nice to talk to you, mate. Let's start with how we know each other. So I, I went to a state growth seminar here in Hobart, December, so a few months ago, late 2021, uh, where you were speaking about marketing for uh, businesses looking at exporting. I hadn't heard any of your material before seeing you present, but I'd had two um, re- good friends highly sure. recommend your material and your presentation style, etc. Tim Polmere from Flat Tummy Tea, episode five, and Tony Kibbe on episode 28, a good friend of mine, worked with me at Lark. Both highly recommended you. And I must say that in that session, apart from uh, feeling challenged at how that you may swear more than I do in presentations <laughs> and meetings, I was absolutely blown away because right. what you what you say is very powerful and aligned exactly with my thoughts on marketing. And uh, one point I did have a good chuckle at was when, um, have you, I assume you've seen the movie Something About Mary? Yeah, yeah, I know it well. So when Ben Stiller gets picked up by the serial killer and he's hitchhiking and they're talking about the seven minute abs and Bill, Ben Stiller goes, well, why wouldn't the competitors come out with six minute abs? And no, no, seven minutes. Anyway, go, this serial killer goes off a bit. And I just laughed when you talked about, uh, I think he said, that when you're talking about the four Ps, he says, uh, there's only four Ps, it's not five fucking Ps, there's four <laughs> Ps only. So that reminded me of that, that movie. So that's how we know each other. Uh, it was a good night. It was a good night, wasn't it? I enjoyed that. It was a good, good evening. It was great. And for the audience, we had a great bar, 270 degree view around Hobart, uh, about the 30th floor, I think it was. Big nice. lightning storm that night it was very, very timely for your dramatic presentation. It was just, it was a bit unfortunate because there were arbitrary moments when that lightning and thunder went off that sort of gave sort of a, a, a kind of gothic. Uh, you know, underlining power to certain points that weren't the bits that I wanted to focus on. So I'd say something like, you know, there are always three things to think about. And the first one is probably that blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah. It felt like someone else was in charge of, I wanted to tell God to sort of, you know, move the, get the, get his timing a bit better, you know. It was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a great evening. Everyone was in, uh, you know, in, it just uh, in, really followed uh, everything you said and spoke with a few people afterwards and they were all blown away as I was as well. So thank great. you for that. So tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. So um, in my 50s, I find myself uh, a founder and entrepreneur, which was certainly not part of the script. I've worked for founders and entrepreneurs my whole life, but I had no idea I'd end up being one. I was a uh, marketing professor for about 25 years and working all that time with very large brands all over the world on on marketing strategy. And... um, uh, about five, it's nearly six years ago now, I took the courses that I taught um, at business schools all over the world. And I really only taught two courses. One is the marketing course that you do in the first year of your MBA. And the other one was a specialist course in brand management. And I put them online and created something different. And um, it, the business took off. So in the last six years, we've grown dramatically. We now attract, it's hard to say because it's the start of the year, but we'll, we'll expect this year to attract probably around 8,000 marketers to come and do the program this year. Yep. We'll turn over an eight-figure sum. Um, and the, the, the program is called the Mini MBA in Marketing uh, and the Mini MBA in Brand Management. And it's... <laughs> A lot of the people who come on the course don't like the name, but it's a very specific name. It's mini for two reasons. It's mini because an MBA is obviously much broader than marketing. You know, the B stands for business. I'm just giving people the marketing part of a a proper top-end MBA course, which is what I taught in the past. And it's mini in the sense that we don't have any expectation that anyone physically comes anywhere near me. Yep. We do it all over a 12-week period, um, and people can study at any time, any, any place. And, yep. and, and that, that's been the engine that, that, that's really made it work. 
Great. And out of interest, are there more more people doing the marketing at Mini MBA or more more the brand management or pretty even? No, marketing, because marketing is the first one and it's probably more broadly uh, attractive. It's probably about uh, 50% bigger each yep. year. Yeah. And what happens is a lot of the marketing people go on and do the brand course and a lot of people who are brand managers or CMOs don't feel like they need the marketing course but want the specialist brand course, which is a little bit more advanced. So, yeah, marketing is the big pull still. Yep, great. And yeah, uh, you're a professor of marketing at uh, Melbourne University until that five or six years ago, I think, because two friends here in Tasmania, Greg Finlay from uh, Blundstone and James Baker from Vericon, both yeah. did their MBAs at Melbourne and you were their, their uh, marketing professor and said they really enjoyed it. Yeah, no, my, my track record as an academic, I finished as a adjunct professor at Melbourne. I was kind of part-time at the end there, but I started teaching at Minnesota in the States, then to London Business School. Um, I was a visiting professor for many years, or four or five years at MIT, and then moved to Melbourne for the sort of last decade of my career. So yeah, I've, I've been around the tracks to say the least. Yep, great. Well, that's kind of our next question is how you started out. Anything else to add there? I mean, you've worked with some really big brands you mentioned on that night. Do you want to share any of those with us? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I was an, a pure play academic. So I did my PhD in marketing at a young age. I went to America to become an assistant professor, still in my 20, late 20s. And I really had no practical experience of any kind. But when I moved to London Business School, because it was London and because they had the key to the doors of most of the big businesses in London, I started to do more and more consulting work on the side. And before I left LBS, really, the consulting part of my life had become the main the, the main job that I did. So I, I stayed on as a professor and I believed that all business school professors should do that, right? They should work in practice yep. and teach what they practice. Um, and so for every day of teaching, I reckon I was doing probably three days of consulting work around brands and brand consulting. And I worked for, you know, I worked for the biggest and the best. I spent about uh, 12 years in Paris working for LVMH. That's for Louis, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton Moe Tennessee, so the world's biggest luxury goods company. So I worked across, I had a title which was Professor de Maison, which I never used. But I worked for all the different uh, CEOs of the different brands within the group. And that was an amazing experience. I did a lot of work with Baxter, a big medical company in Chicago. Down in Oz, a lot of work with Flight Center, a company I love dearly. So I was, you know, I was working across all kinds of different sectors, doing actual uh, brand and marketing work and and learning you know learning like everyone else so i think that was my shtick right was i was a very bad academic yeah. but I, I was a very i was a very good consultant and that that was the angle that i took yep i read something i think last year lvmh their net profit margin is, is something like 60 percent. obviously luxury goods which just yeah. bears out how fucking good you are at your job <laughs> yeah no lvmh was a place where you know, you've got about 75 brands there that range from Dom Perignon right across to Vuitton and Dior, you know, Tag Heuer. So the, the capability to build luxury brands and protect price premium was a real competency. I, I, learned, I mean, I should have been paying them. I learned more from the men and women I work <laughs> for than, yeah. than they learned from me, I reckon. Yeah, great. And six years ago when you started, uh, moved to online courses here, how old were you then? I would have been... 40 about 46 my daughter had just been born it's linked to my daughter because you know i was spending two weeks a month on planes out of australia you know tasmania isn't the center of of, of brand and marketing so my, my wife grew up you know used to me heading out you know for one week out of two i was somewhere else yeah. overseas obviously when my daughter was born that kind of changed and genuinely the creation of mini mba was because we both knew I couldn't go away anymore. And what the hell was I going to do? You know, yeah. so that that's where it came from. And I'm kind of proud of it because it was a strategic creation. Becoming a brand consultant when you're a professor of branding isn't really strategic. It's just a side business that happens accidentally. Yep. Um, creating mini MBA was a proper strategic thought process of, you know, what can I do? Applying the principles of marketing and strategy to my own life which I'd never done before. Yep, great. And do you have any other key numbers to illustrate the growth of the business over the last six years? You've mentioned yeah. eight figures top line. 
Number low eight three. figures. I don't, you yep. know, we're not, we're not, we're not crazy, crazy. Yep. We're doing very, very well. Yeah, we're growing at about, if you look at the CAGR, it's probably about 30%. Right. And we've yep. maintained that pretty much consistently since the start. Um, if you look at, we've now got, I think, eight full time employees based out of London. Yep. Um, and I mean, the, the data we look at most is, is net promoter score. So we're almost on a, a plus 80 net promoter score. Holy shit, which, that's good. It's really good, and we really, I really push the team that we want to be better. But I really love. I mean, I really have a problem with people that don't like Net Promoter Score. I don't think it predicts future business success. Mm. But what I do think is, it's just of all the metrics I get at the end of each course, getting an MPS and slicing it by: are they loving it nine ten? Are they passive seven eight? Are they a detractor zero to six? And then getting the comment underneath about why they gave us the score is fantastically useful. Data. It is. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, we're proud of the plus 80 uh, or the near plus 80 we've got. And we're now, uh, we've got more than 60 countries uh, yeah. represented on the program. And we're about two thirds B2B now. So more and more companies send their teams through us. Yep. And about a third, it's individual sign up. That's great. Phenomenal growth. And obviously thousands and thousands of people have already been through the, both courses. 20,000 right now. We're, we're alumni of about 20,000. Right. And, and the, thing, the thing about them, Troy, is they're senior. Yeah. We've managed to avoid the young kids. Not that we have anything against the young kids, but a lot of these online programs have been deviled by, you know, children that are, you know, still learning their trade and good on them. Yep. Um, we've, our average age is in, you know, early 40s. Yep. So we, we get much more senior people and we are very thankful for that. <laughs> That's great. Well done on the growth. That's amazing. When was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? Well, that's a good one. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm ever in that mindset. Um, it's really interesting because having worked with, like take Screw Turner at Flight Center or... Um, uh, who's another good example of a founder that I've Donna Karen. I worked with Donna Karen in New York. Um, I never thought I'd become a very small you know, version of them, but I don't think anyone ever feels like they are a success. Right. I think it's more that you feel like you've made something that works. It can always work better. And I don't think you ever get to rest on your laurels, unfortunately. So yeah, I think I've been successful. I don't think I failed in my career. I think I've been successful but I don't think you ever rest on it. Do you know what I mean? You just keep going. Yeah. What does success look like to you? Oh, money, just money. Um, <laughs> I'm not one of these people that's, I, I have my own life and interests separate from work to do yep. with my family and animals and uh, hanging out and drinking wine and, and looking after my, my, uh, my acres, which has nothing to do with work. I'm very working class. I work for the money. And if there wasn't money, I wouldn't do it anymore. And if I had enough money, I wouldn't do it either because there's other things I would do with my life. I'm not yeah. one of these people driven by work other yeah. than the fact it generates shit tons of cash. And, and it's, <laughs> it's enjoyable. Don't get me wrong. It's enjoyable. I have a life separate from, from marketing and online stuff, which is very pleasurable and lovely, which is more than, you know, which, which would take all of me if I could, if I could afford it. Perfect question for you. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business? Oh, look, strip out a few of your loyalists and spend some time finding out why they are loyal to you. Yep. Um, it, there's many other things you can do, but if you wanted a great insight into your own business, the irony of particularly smaller businesses, the reason you're successful is very, very rarely the reason why the founder thinks they're successful. Yep. And particularly about three, four years in when the momentum is moving um, and, and successful, sitting down with four or five people who just love your product or service and having a beer or a coffee and saying, you know, tell me, you know, honestly, why do you like our business and what's wrong with it and what's good about it is the single best thing you can do. Yeah, totally agree. And how did you fund this business? I'm very, very risk averse. So... I was probably, I'll be, you know, I can be more frank about my own cons consulting life. I mean, I was probably making about a million dollars a year from consulting. Um, my day rate was very high and I was doing a lot of work. And so the only cost to the business for me was that nine months I pretty much full time worked on developing it. And, you know, so it cost me, you know, 750 grand of lost income. Yeah, that was the that was the cost. 
I was not, I am not one of these entrepreneurs that is capable of taking their house, their life, their family's future and betting on themselves. I, I respect those people tremendously. That's just not something I could ever do. And so I worked out a way of doing it in such a way that I was committed. But if it hadn't have worked, I had a back channel and I could get back back to business. Yeah. So that, that's how we funded it. I have a partner. So the, the company that publishes Marketing Week in the UK is a company called Exium. And when I, when I set out doing this, I persuaded them, and they were not that keen to begin with, um, to, to be my 50-50 partner. Great. So the other, so they were, I have to say they were great because as we scaled, they handled the tax and the, uh, and the headcounts and the office, you know, all that shit that I just couldn't have handled yeah. out of London. So it was, it's been a great partnership, I have to say. Great. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Uh, yeah, I would. We're still only just t- touching the, the corners of what's going to be a, a, a revolution in training, I think. Um, uh, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. The time is right. Obviously, I was pre-COVID. We were, you wouldn't see, it's interesting, people think we're a COVID business. COVID hasn't done us any harm, obviously, but we were, if you look at our growth pre-COVID and post, it's pretty much on the same trajectory. Yep. So, yeah, I think our timing was perfect in the sense that it, there's a growing awareness, I think. And look, it's one that struck me relatively late in, in, the, in the process, that asking people, I'll, I'll give you an example. So when I taught at Melbourne Business School, which is a fine school, but, you know, we have, you know, the average age of the person studying for their MBA is about the same age as the people doing my online mini MBA. And we were asking them to come in at weekends, you know, Saturday and Sunday, you know, 8.45, sit in a theatre with 100 other people until 5 o'clock, right? And at lunchtime, they go out and they move their cars, you know what I mean, and then come yeah. back in again. Hmm. They've all got two-year-old, three-year-old kids. They've all got jobs. And it's just, A, stupid. And B, it's a shitty way to learn. If I said to you, Troy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna make you learn some things. We can either do it at your, wherever you wanna do it online, or we can do it by bringing you into a theater, making you sit for eight hours and write shit down with a pen and paper, right? So I think we're getting to the point where that, there is a place for physical education, yep. but it, it, it's definitely the time now to, to supplement it with, what I would now say is a superior form of learning through virtual classrooms. Yeah, totally agree. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? It's probably um, early on someone uh, replicated the course in a sort of foolhardy attempt to do a digital version of the course. And I got very, very angry because most of it was my IP and someone had basically watched the course and then it sort of regurgitated it badly in a, in a foolhardy attempt to make a, a digital version. And so I really lost my shit at that point and got pretty angry. Um, I, I, was rest- I tell you, the one thing I was smart enough to do was I didn't stop that program from running because if I'd have stopped it, which I think I probably could have done, they would have assumed it would have made a fortune. And, and I was, the, you know, I let it fail badly. Yeah. But it made me very angry. And I think protecting and being, it wasn't my fault on any level, but I think being clearer on IP and, and you know, when I busted the person who was doing it, their attitude was, look, this is general marketing stuff. And so I just sent them pages and pages of stuff that was all mine and my, you know, I think they thought this was all general knowledge. And it's like, that's my stuff. Yep. And you just copied it. And I think that that was the big lesson. And I think for small businesses, IP uh, is unfortunately one of those things you do have to get a hold of before someone steals it because then it tends to be too late. Yep. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Uh, I think it's, it's management of people and learning not to do it. So I've, I've never been a leader. I've never managed anyone other than myself. And now that we have a team of seven or eight people, what I've, tried to do is to let I've got a a very good uh managing director Sam I don't even know what Sam's official title is in London who does things very well and it's teaching myself just to let him get on with it yeah Yeah. I mean I've got enough to do with content and you know all of that so learning to let go of that and not micromanage badly and be you know be be humble and be part of the system yeah 
what have you enjoyed the least about managing the fast growth? Uh, it's probably the operational stuff where we have to do budgeting and all that. But I've got to be honest with you, you know, Exy and my partner takes all of that shit and handles it. I've been very surprised, I'm impressed. They set these budgets. And I have to tell you, in the five years we've been doing it, they've almost been perfectly delivered. You know what right. I mean? And, mm -hmm. and that, that discipline, I, I would have had no idea about. So, yeah, I think that, that uh, the whole management planning budgeting thing, but I've been, I've been saved from it by Axiom to some degree. What do you love most about growing a small business? Uh, it's nice to, to see something have an identity. You know, having advised all these companies for all these years on what would happen to them as the brand grows, it's really interesting watching our brand grow when it's part of you. You know what I mean? I never thought I'd get that pleasure. So it's like being a school teacher and then having your own kids late in life. And, and, and having, having the experience, but now having it for yourself. So I really enjoy watching a thing getting born. I think it will outlive me. I think it's that good now. So at some point I will, you know, pass it on a little bit. And I love that. I love that idea. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? I think it's the, the, the realization that uh, virtual training is better than physical training. So when I started out, I knew that I could make a bit of money from the mini MBA. And I knew it was going to be more convenient for me and also for the marketers doing the course. You know, the whole point was I can give you the kind of training you'd get at London Business School or MIT, but you can have it at home for two grand, right? Yep. So I knew convenience and I knew money were going to be part of it. What I did not expect, which took a couple of years to realize and really did a mind shift on me was the people that are doing this course are actually learning more than the ones that are going into a business school and having this course or an equivalent taught to them physically. I did not expect that. I thought yeah. it would be a second class version, mm -hmm. cheaper and more convenient. It's definitely superior. What is the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? Uh, it's probably discipline to, to, to it, it, you know, strategy is saying no. And in small businesses, it has to be so, so disciplined to not getting spread into other things. You know, I have a job to do with respect to mini MBA, which is still quite busy. And if I start getting distracted and doing things that aren't part of the remit, everything starts to get messed up. So it's definitely focus and discipline. Yeah, totally agree. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our kick-ass manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. This may not be as relevant for you because I think your business partner takes care of most of it, but can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes? Yeah. Yep. I'm sort of peripherally involved. Um, I think what we've learned, we, we, we started out accidentally with some great people. Uh, and I think that's often how businesses begin. It just so happened I had this terrific woman who now is no longer with the business, Joe, who was just sort of, you know, was the woman that was available to do this on, on the Axiom side. She then knew a sales guy who was good and it was available, Matt, and she had Sam. And so we sort of got gifted these kind of, and, and I mean this in the loveliest way, these sort of lost children who weren't part of any, any major thing. And they turned out to be brilliant. And then I think what happens next and what we've learned is stay with that kind of genetic code. Let them find people they've worked with before yep. or that they rate and let them hire who they want to hire. And don't, don't lose that track if you get lucky. You know, when I, when I built my house in Tassie, I had an old builder working for me, Rob Sweeney. And Rob always said, look, if you start out with the first two or three good tradesmen, they'll then know other tradesmen to bring in and the house will be a joy. But if you get one ringer at the start, it ruins things. And I, I think that's absolutely right. So whenever we've hired people that my team rate, it's worked out great. And I think that's, I mean, that can't go on forever. I mean, we only have eight employees but it's a great way to run a sort of small business. What are some things you'd recommend to help building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Uh, I think it's, it's tricky. I mean, I've met my team in, in physical premise probably seven or eight times total. 
in the six years we've been doing it, because I'm in Australia and they're in London. Taking everyone out for dinner when you can do that and getting drunk should definitely be top of the list for those that drink alcohol. A couple yep. of us don't, but the ones that do, it's, it's, I think it's a great way just to have a chat. I think making making it clear that, you you know, Screw Turner, again, is very influential on me. Screw's, a bit, I think, close to a billionaire, not at the moment because he's stock shit at the moment. But One of the founders of uh, Flight Center and Top One Deck of the founders was... of Flight Center, the, the controlling sort of uh, founding yeah. member, for a while he was a billionaire and I think now he's not because of the thing but screw just wears a tank top and goes in the office every day and if you ever if you're ever in the elevator with screw in Brisbane in the offices you know we'll be in the elevator me and screw going up and six kids who are all 25 will walk in and they'll go yeah g'day screw yeah g'day there's absolutely no fucking bullshit and I, <laughs> I adore that and one yeah. of the reasons is screw makes openly makes fun of how useless he is at some things and I've done that myself, and it's not hard to find areas where I am. Yeah. Letting the team know that you are, you know, you say to them, I'm fucking useless at this, but do you think that works? But te- and, and telling them, but tell me if it's a shit idea. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very important. Very important. Tell the audience how you've handled balance. Um, it's not something that comes to me particularly easily. I, I think it's listening to other people tell you that it's not balanced i don't think you can see it yourself and i think sometimes it, you rely on someone going it's all right we can do this and, and you know so i think it's listening to others that balances things out now professional development obviously you've invested a lot in yourself over the years um mm. you, you keep that up in especially for this new business any you know any areas of professional development you've dived into specifically look it's a funny one with me i I mean, I, so I had an undergraduate degree and a PhD by the time I was, I think, 25, right? So I was very much from 18 to 25, and I, and I was obviously broke, and I had, you know, I, I had no experience of anything. And I can remember at that time, and I don't know where the voice came from, saying to me, you never regret investing in yourself, yeah? yeah? And this will play out for the rest of your career. So I was very front-loaded in my development in the sense that I did a PhD when I was so young, it was still painless to do it. And it, has, it was the, obviously the best investment I've ever given in myself. In more recent years, I, I, all I do is keep topping up my knowledge of marketing by, by learning from others, right? So I'm keeping updating what I've got. But I'm a, I'm a very niche-focused guy, you know. For yeah. that Have you had mentors or coaches along the way? Um, I've had a couple. I mean, look, there's two kinds of mentor for me, and, and they were always very unofficial, right? There's, um, I really would regard a lot of the senior people at LVMH as people that I learned from, you know, in how they behaved, in decisions they took. Uh, Jean Andre, who's the CEO of Benefit now at, uh, at uh, Sephora, Ruggio, he's been a guy that I just watched and thought, God, he's just got it, man, the way he is. He, he was very important. Uh, Jean-Christophe Baban at Tag Heuer, now Bulgari, was another guy you just watched and went, how do you do that, you know? And, and so they became, at an early stage in my life, sort of exemplars. Yeah. And then closer to home, and you spend time with them, like we go and have dinner and stuff. So you spend time with them and you can just, you could actually ask them and learn from them. And then probably closer to home, the biggest mentor I've had is probably Ian Hardy, who ran uh, LVMH House, which is our internal consulting team, and then went on to run Learning for Sephora. He was always a good sound box who would occasionally pull you up. But look, I'm a I'm an asshole, Troy. Like I will not fucking listen to anyone really. Like I'm <laughs> I, I'm 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 giving you these people because I do genuinely learn from how they were, but I'm my own fucking dude. Do you know what I mean? For good and for good and for bad. Like I'm not, you know, I, I know the track record says reach out to mentors. I'm such an asshole, I would never listen. Do you know? <laughs> I gotta be honest. And do you have a board of directors or advisors for mini MBA? Well, not, not as such. What we've got is the, the Exium senior management team and me get together uh, monthly and we just review numbers and stuff online. And we're going to meet in Singapore next month, which will be fun. So that's kind of the team. I mean, and they're the ones, you know, it's become such a big business now. They're the ones that are monitoring it and, and trying, you know, they're very good to me. I'm occasionally an asshole to them because I want to protect the product. Yeah. But I really have, have grown to trust the way they're managing the, the entity. All right, Mark, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? 
time uh there's never enough time and the, and the more you spread yourself across things the less time there is it's, so it's definitely time management favorite business book which has helped you the most oh uh <laughs> well in all honesty i'm not a big fan of business books i like reading but not books the book that's influenced my development the most is the old man in the sea by ernest hemingway because it teaches brevity and focus yep. it's something every manager should read yeah any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development yeah, I, I really like On Strategy, which is a marketing podcast with Fergus. I forget Fergus' his second name. It's basically a case study each week of an advertising or marketing case, which walks through what they did. And it's absolutely brilliant. It's really well done. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? Oh, uh, Net Promoter Score. It gets so much shit from marketers who are over complex. Yep. I, 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 remembering that it's not just the score but breaking down the verbatim about why they gave the score. I just love that proximity of that data. Yeah, we use Net Promoter Score in a few businesses. I've, I've introduced it there and on exit surveys, a combination, for example, yeah. Ratho, Ratho Farm. I'm not sure if you've been out there at Bothwell. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's great. So it's a very short survey. But we asked that Net Promoter Score first. How likely are you to recommend us to a friend or colleague between zero and 10, not one and 10? But then we also ask, what's one thing you would change about your experience or stay with us? What's one thing you wouldn't change? Um, who was the manager on duty? And then any other feedback? And then just people go to town on you. And it blocks a lot of negative stuff getting through to socials as well. But it, you're right, exactly. The, what they write in that, those free text box is, is where all the, the gold really is, particularly if they're giving you a two, they will tell you what the fuck you It you've really done. is, Troy. And I think being able to, I mean, I sit down literally. So if we have 2,000 people on a course. I sit down and I do the promoters first because they're all just basically kissing your ass and it's like why you, but knowing why you would is important. And then I do the passives and, and the detractors and there aren't as many, but there's often, there's gold there in terms of, there's often one thing that they just didn't like that stopped it being great and we can do something about that, you know? Yep. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Uh, it's going to be all right. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm a working class boy. I had no money when I started out um, and a little bit of not really debt either, but I was always, you know, I, I've had sweaty times where I've been worried about clearing a mortgage, you know what I mean? And um, I think knowing that it's going to be all right and you will have enough and it'll be, you know, it sounds weird, but I think that's what many people, especially working class people, you know, I, I love them, you know, the, the rich private school mates I've got, they're lovely people. But there's a definite difference, which is they can always rely on, on a, on a, on a, on a right. net yeah. underneath them that I never had. And yeah. most people of my background never had. So being told, if I could go back in time to myself when I was, you know, early 30s and going, you're going to have enough money to service everything. In fact, you're going to have quite a lot of money. Relax. Not rich, just you're going to have enough. It's, yeah. it's a real important thing. More important than, see, a lot of these people that go on about find your passion and all that horseshit, it's the worst fucking advice in the world, man. <laughs> you know, that's why kids are ending up being like professional gamers, you know, and all that fucking bullshit. Yeah. It's not about finding your passion, man. It's about finding a place where you can make enough dough, right? Mm. Purpose for most working class people, which is 90% of the population, purpose is about fucking paying your mortgage and making sure your kids are all right. Yep. And what happens is all these people that made their money or had it already given to them are the ones we listen to with all these messages about find what you're interested in, find your passion. That's great if you've got fucking $10 million in the bank and a safety net. Most working men and women, they can't afford to do that. What they need to do, their purpose in life is to not be in debt and to have a decent retirement. And that's miserable and working class by definition. But it's really important, do you know what I mean? Because I think I worry about kids being told these days, find your passion, that fucking Venn diagram where you find things you're good at, that you're passionate about and all that. I think it's bad advice, man, bad yeah. advice. Well, thanks very much for your time, Mark. I think the audience get a lot of value out of what you shared with us. Congratulations on the, the success and growth of the mini MBA. Uh, wonderful to hear. And this is our 200th episode going live. So I was really- Well done, mate. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, a bit over two years, I'm really- really looking was looking forward to having you on and glad it was the 200th episode that goes live so really appreciate i'm honored you. troy i'm honored to be your 200 if you get to 500 let's do another one where we can look back on the Done. beach i'll put it in my spreadsheet right now <laughs> <laughs> thanks mate we'll catch up in uh the hobart for a beer when you're back from sydney uh, with greg as well 
Beers Ahoy, mate, in Salamanca. Beers Ahoy, I reckon this. I think is... we've got to go to Hobart Brewing Company, considering I, I chair that board. I think that's where we'll have to. Do you it. really? Oh, yeah. Well, For... well I, I've been giving you a lot of money over the years, and I didn't even know. <laughs> well, there you go. <clears throat> I'll buy you a few beers down there one day in the sun. In the next one. So. Sold, sold. <laughs> Thanks for that's it thanks for listening please leave a review in itunes or whatever platform you listen to us on it means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey